Lynn, I'll take your comment, Lynn, and then we will, and then I want to give an explanation of how, why I think we are doing this. Uh, yeah, I was just going to make a comment uh, in regards to why we're doing this. Um, I'm not sure whether it's, I'm not sure how relevant it is, but the thoughts that came to my mind were the fact that sexism, um, patriarchy, uh, society as it is and has been since Eve is um, is so ingrained in us that it's very hard at times to recognise it in ourselves. Um, in order to recognise it more in ourselves, in order to represent anything that is representing the truth that needs to be represented specifically for the Sunday law. Uh, we need to have not only a, a better understanding from our own perspectives as in to change our own thinking, um, but we need to be able to see what the opposition or what the other side of that is because we can't, we can't really counter something we don't understand. So we've got to look at this from the perspective of, um, what are the what, what are we fighting against you know really now especially um it's one thing to sort of look back and say oh well this is what happened with eve or this is what happened then and that's all well and good but what are we actually contending with now today as we are approaching the sunday law and what will that uh require of us if we're able to stand for this truth you know what will that require of us so that's um the thoughts that i had on it anyway mainly the change within in ourselves our own view so that we can represent a more accurate version of equality as we increase our understanding and see the problems in society i guess Thank you, Lynn. I'm going to hear from Marilyn and then I'll comment on your point. Um, it's just, it's me. Oh, yeah, um, James. yeah sorry. I, 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 I came down here for tomorrow's um, Sabbath. Um, just sort of to add on to what was just said, I, I couldn't quite catch everything, but it's just more, more of an understanding of who's the perpetrator and who's the victim in, in situations, either in their uh, personal lives in, um, in the past or uh, and in the present and stuff like that. And sort of, um, yeah, basically re just fixing that sort of thing, I guess. I don't know how else to put it, but. Are you okay if I write understanding the mechanisms of sexism? Yes. How it yeah. operates? That's yeah. what I heard because, if I was to condense what you said. Yeah, because I mean, everyone's um, experiences with sexism is different. So some people have more of a victim side of it. Some people are more the perpetrators. Sometimes it's a mix, but yeah. Go and explain why I think we're doing this. This is what I see happen externally, and I believe it happens in the movement. Let's take the concept of defunding the police. What you have are two sides, and it's all too easy for the left wing to say of the right wing, the right wing doesn't care about African-American lives. Once police harming minorities. What they do is they create a straw man. They say, this is all white supremacists. And they have made what we call a straw man because that is an easier argument to fight. If we're fighting people who just say they should be shooting African-American young men. We should be white supremacists. That's easy to fight. 
And then the right wing says of the left wing, you're trying to abolish the police. You're fine with murder, rape, theft. You're fine with anarchy. You're trying to get rid of the police force entirely. And what they do is they create a straw man. A man made of straw because it's easy to fight with a man made of straw. There's no real substance to him. You can go to town. It's easy to fight with. Neither side in that, that scenario are representing the other correctly and both are giving a misleading representation about what each side is saying. In reality, I won't go into the right-wing arguments, but in reality what the people calling for the defunding of the police are saying is we need to stop giving the police tanks. We need to stop funding them like an internal military. We need to create a radical cultural change, a radical change of mindset within the police force through a change in how they're funded, uh, what weapons they, they are given, through how they are educated, especially when it comes to issues of racism and mental health. But you make it reasonable and it gives nothing for the right wing to really fight. So they create this kind of two-sided system where you have these two terrible sounding scenarios. Just one point on defunding the police. There was a really good uh, Vox article that um, Barack Obama shared and agreed with. You can't defund the police until you do something about gun culture. If you're going to arm 18 year olds in the United States with semi-automatics, you're going to have to give your police force a tank. Not that they use their weapons correctly, but when you arm your population to a greater extreme than a, a modern police force should be armed, you're going to have to then arm your police force like a military to control the population that's essentially a militia in, in a way that that was never designed to be. So there's more to this argument than just defunding the police and taking tanks off them. It's a call for a cultural change within the police force, but also a cultural change within American society that deals with gun control um, and deals with systemic racism and education. It's a broader argument, but Fox doesn't want to fight that more complicated argument. It's too hard to fight that more nuanced and reasonable argument so they create a straw man. But the left can also do this of the right wing. And this is what I see happen in the movement and I believe it is incredibly destructive. The reality of it is more like this. Over here, you have Roy Den Hollander. And I could have spent all of the last classes, instead of using Max, Instead of look, using Dawkins, who is a feminist, and Hitchens, who is a left-wing liberal, we could have just gone straight to Roy Den Hollander and seen the Trinity. We could have seen libertarianism. We could have seen um, men's rights activism. And we could have seen atheism. He held ultimately to the Trinity doctrine. And then we could have compared it with radical feminism. But my concern isn't this. My concern is this. What people do in this movement is they come to me and they say, I love this message. This message has freed me. This message is beautiful. It is wonderful. And that That to me is as meaningless as Hitchens saying he's a liberal. What people do is they take this message
They discard a portion of it, that which causes personal conviction. They take what is left and twist it just ever so slightly so it puts them in a slightly better frame of view. They take what is left and they add just a little of their own. And then this is what they tell me they love. And I hear it over and over and over again. And what I've wanted to do is not to tell us what the Sunday law will be like, because frankly, I don't really care what they are going to do. What I want us to see is what exists inside this movement, because there are far more libertarians and men's rights activists within this movement than there are radical feminists. And I do not say that lightly. I know that sounds like an exaggeration, but I'll say it again. There are more men's rights activists within this movement, I would say, speaking to Australia, within Australia, than there are radical feminists. And the reason that I wanted to go through this process is to not show you the Roy Dan Hollander, because it's easy to see, it's easy to condemn. I want you to show the rational and the reasonable, not because we can just condemn Dawkins or Hitchens, but so we can see that that is the spectrum on which we exist. When we misuse the message, which I believe happens to the majority of people within this movement, is the fundamental reason why over four years I still find so little change. It's not to see him. It's not to see him. It's to see that when I sold libertarianism, it sounded good. It sounded good because that is what, to much of the movement, did, does sound right, appropriate, and attractive. Freedom. But my fundamental issue is not really libertarianism, though it's related, is not really atheism, though it's related. My issue is this one. This is what is constantly coming up within the movement. I had a message from someone recently, a man in the movement who we have also organisationally disciplined for harassing underage women in this movement. He sent me a text and he said, most men right, men's rights arguments are so extreme, they're, they're terrible, they're obviously terrible. But he said, some of them seem to make sense. So where do you, Elder Tess, draw the line? He wasn't completely honest when he said that, because when he said they seem to make sense, and then he asks me to accommodate those arguments, asks how I'm going to accommodate those arguments. He's not saying that they seem to make sense. He's saying that they make sense to him and he believes them. And then he's asking, where are you going to stop with radical feminism and allow the men's rights arguments that make sense? I said a few things to him. He doubled down on that and then started explaining to me the men's rights arguments that make sense to him. And I think that if I'd have come out six weeks ago and started teaching those arguments, the majority of the movement would have said amen. Because we don't exist here, but the vast majority of the movement doesn't exist here. They exist here, mixing what they have left of the message which, with what they still believe to be rational, reasonable, 
logical. Always the arguments that justify their own behaviour. And then I'll make a comment talking about the love of Jesus and people will say, Amen, we loved what you just said. Why? Because it agrees with the tiny bit of the message that you had left when you already justified it, when you already cut up that message to justify your own sexism. That is why we are doing this. We are doing it because it's helpful to see sexism in society and in STEM. It's helpful to see that there's two streams of information within the scientific community, that Gina Rippon is fighting a battle with the scientific community, that they are so prone to bias. It helps to refocus sexism on a global scale and then reevaluate it, the cause of sexism. It's important to find the underlying cause of sexism, the threat that poses, the understanding the mechanisms of sexism is important, but all because of this that you said, Lynn, so we can see it in ourselves. Because the arguments that I continually hear People saying, I want to teach about the Sunday law, but I want to teach about inequality in how we treat our children. Sounds good. I want to teach about the need for a radical feminism and also how this helps everyone because of the male suicide rate. That is a men's rights argument, one that I'm going to need to tackle because it's just so prolific. These are men's rights arguments and people don't necessarily know that they are making men's rights arguments. They don't know where they stand on this spectrum. They think they are here looking over and condemning this. In reality, they're here. They might not be over here with Roy Dan Hollander, but they're more over here with Dawkins than they realise. If this is an 18-year-old white boy with a gun, this is Tucker Carlson. This is the rational and the reasonable and the logical that paves the way for this. And I don't want to spend my time condemning this because no one in the movement is here, but very, very few people in the movement are here. And they're not here because how they've treated the message over four years. This isn't about us understanding the externals of the Sunday law. This has always been about us understanding ourselves and this movement. We create straw man arguments when we only focus on the most ugly of what libertarianism is. I could have discussed libertarianism and just gone straight to Gavin McInnes. I still want to talk about him. But I wanted us to see the beauty of that argument. It's libertarianism that speaks with hope in this world, that says that humanity is so fundamentally good that if you just backed off and gave humanity a chance to educate themselves, to work together, to dialogue, gave everyone their freedoms, they would figure it out on their own. They would move ever upwards. That's libertarianism. If you just stopped trying to create a big government that through taxes is going to support institutions, you stop that, people will fundraise, individuals will rise up and raise money and fundraise to support the poor and the needy. Churches will support the needy again. It is a beautiful picture that exists here. And I want us to see that subtlety not because it exists externally, but because it exists internally. I hear on a day-to-day -day basis more men's rights arguments, either through spoken word or through the silence of people in this movement, than I ever hear radical feminist arguments. It is more common still than radical feminism. Some of the reasons that I was given in this last week, some of the men's rights arguments that make sense to the fellow that wrote to me, he said men feel lesser because they are failing to provide financially the way they are expected to and are trying to if they, they don't or can't provide for their families. Uh, men don't want to open up because you can seem to appear weak. 
the whole men can't cry ideology, so they don't know how to express themselves. And he says feminism is not to blame for that, but these are men's rights arguments. Um, I've heard that men's rights argument multiple times about the suicide rate, and I have not enjoyed the research that has been necessary to combat that. It's a very dark place to go, but I've had to, and we're going to have to discuss it, not because of men's rights activists out in the community making trouble, but because this is what constantly comes up internally. And where do we go? Where do we go to understand the ugliness of the beautiful arguments? We go to race. We go to Millerite history. I want to quote from the same source I read in 2019, and that should tell you something about how long I've been fighting this battle. The same source I quoted in 2019 at the German International Camp Meeting, Southern Slavery and the Bible. Southerners making an argument for slavery. What were their arguments pro-slavery? I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to ask someone to turn it into, into gender. Reword it. Use gender and tell me what their argument is. In return for food, clothing, house, room, medical attendance and support in old age, about one third of the labour which is required of the white man in most countries is required of the black. The rest of his time is spent in singing, dancing, laughing, chattering and bringing up pigs and chickens. So Catherine, I'm going to ask you to turn that into a gendered one. When the South says that in return for food, clothing, house, room, medical attendance and support in old age, African-American slaves only had to work about a third of, expend about a third of the labour that white men in most countries are doing for the same thing, food, clothing, house, medical bills, and support in old age. Uh, okay, you got me there, I think. Um, it's dim gender. I mean, I, I've been exposed to this, but this, I guess, what my initial reaction is, is this idea that women don't really contribute anything. Like a lot of their work that, that is done by women isn't even seen as invisible. Um, but I'm not sure that I'm really getting what. When what someone in the movement says to me that men's rights activists make a, a good argument because they they recognise the burden that falls on men to provide women with food, women and children with food, clothing, a home, medical attendance and support in old age. That that falls to men and they feel burdened with that. Not sure. I want us to see the same argument being made here. What, what amount of worry did a slave really have for what he had to eat, what he had to wear? If he got sick, whether or not he would get medical attendance, how he would be supported when he was elderly? How much did a slave have to carry that weight? That was the burden carried by the slave owner. That was their responsibility. When someone says that that is the, the pressure, the responsibility, the guilt men feel when they can't provide, do they honestly think that women are not worried about what they're going to wear or what they're going to eat? I've dealt with case after case after case 
within this movement where a husband leaving this movement is found to be refusing to provide his own wife and children with food in countries where they cannot access it without him and they're hungry. I've dealt with case after case after case of where women are trapped in abusive relationships and cannot leave because they do not have the mechanisms to provide their own food, clothing, home, medical attendance. Cases of women not feeling they can leave because they're aging and they're worried that they have no ability to provide for themselves. So to say that women don't have that burden for themselves or their children, and that's a guilt, a weight that men feel. I want us to bring that to race and see the South made that exact same argument. If we think that in Millerite history, all that occurred was slave owners, who believed in torture, and then there were abolitionists who believed in complete and total societal equality. We end up, like many, rewriting the history of the Civil War and of slavery. That was not where the South stood. That's the first men's rights argument I wanted to tackle. Second, they romanticize a loving relationship. The Southerner has been reared among them, African-American slaves from childhood, and in general has a tenderness of affection of which Northern men can have no conception. Great care is taken by the law to guard slaves against oppression and wrong, and after six years residence in the South, I can safely say I never saw more than one instance of cruelty towards a slave and that was perpetrated by a foreigner. So abuse doesn't really exist, certainly not on the scale that people are saying it exists. Instead, even though there is a hierarchy, it is built upon tenderness of affection and love. Bring that into gender. But the key argument that that document, that book made was aren't white people suffering too? They, abolitionists, seem not to be moved by the sufferings of those who are nominally free, white people. So abolitionists are not moved by the sufferings of the white free people. That is an attack they go to great efforts to make, let me gender it. Radical feminists are not appropriately moved by the sufferings of men. They then give case after case after case of the sufferings of white people, especially in Britain. They give case after case of the sufferings of children. Here was a boy harnessed as a beast and worked and treated as a brute. No parallel to this inhumanity can be found on slave plantations in the South but hundreds such occur in the Brampton coal mines. There is tenfold more sufferings in some portions of the world among the Caucasian than in the South among the African race. Yet these poor sufferers, white sufferers of other lands excite no sympathy in their behalf. These men, these suffering men are not, exert, are not exciting the sympathy of the leadership of this movement. I will give you one instance of labor and suffering Ignorance and degradation, it exists in the Brampton coal pits in England, where if their own citizens were blessed with the liberty and ease of our slaves, it would be a most glorious act of emancipation. What happened with second wave radical feminism is at the very beginning, even with the writing of uh, the feminine mystique, you find it in that book because it was early days, there's this idea that gendered stereotypes harm men and women and that we can free women from sexism and abuse, but that this will also benefit men because men are also harmed by gender stereotypes, gendered expectations. Early days of second wave feminism was supportive of that idea. They wanted men to get on board and see that if gender equality came about, it could help them too. It could help men as well. And this is what happened. 
what men started to develop, the men who were at that point completely supportive of second wave feminism, this is great. Sure, women in the workplace, women outside the home, this is great. There's unity between men and women, of course not between the extremities, but generally speaking, there's unity between men and women on second wave feminism. And then men started to say this. Men have the feeling of power. So men have the feeling of power. They have the power and they feel that in the home, in society, in, in Congress, everywhere you find men and women, men have that feeling, the reality and the feeling of power. But they said, women have the power of feeling. So men have the feeling of power and women have the power of feeling. And then men started to say this, we're all the same, we're all suffering, we're all hurting. And remember, this is 1960s. Most places, marital rape is still, is still legal. We're generations of 20 year old, 30 year old women away from the Me Too movement when they can even start opening their mouths. They are still trying to open a bank account without the approval of a male relative. It is complete slavery in so many aspects of their lives, including in the hidden physical and sexual relationships of the home. And second wave feminists started to say, no, no, you can't say that. Sure, gender equality can help men, but only if men realize that this is not the same thing. If only men realize that the patrial, patriarchal system is built on their misuse of power and their abuse, only if they take individual responsibility for sexism, misogyny and abuse. And this is where the men's rights movement started. It started right in the center of second wave feminism. Before radical feminists started saying you individually, you men are part of the problem. Before they started saying that, they all got along. It was like that in this movement. When we started saying gender equality, the men said, amen. My wife can go off to work now. Maybe I might retire. It was fine. But then when we started to pull out the sexual abuse, the physical abuse, the psychological, when we started to say, no, these aren't equal, that's when so much of this movement started to just cut the message down, twist it, go quiet, to me often, add a little of their own, and often are still here. Often are still here saying they love the message, that they want to support it. But the reason that we're doing this is because I want us to see what's inside the movement. We've already done that with libertarianism. We barely got into libertarianism when so many of us, and I'm talking comments I was getting internationally said, that sounds really good. It sounds so beautiful. I'd like that. Or messages from people that were saying, I was absolutely a libertarian in 2020. I didn't go into gender equality. I went straight into libertarianism and freedom and I can see now the mistakes I made. What we need to do as a movement is see, not necessarily how we just went into libertarianism, but how we went into men's rights arguments. And if we're going to do that, we need to see that Dawkins is a feminist and Hitchens is left wing, that the arguments are beautiful. And according to the last week, week's news, Tucker Carlson strongly condemns racism. We have to do two things with these external issues. One, we have to listen to what people say.
not, rep not misrepresent what they are saying, not misrepresent Hitchens and just say that he is a far right extremist without explaining how he supports gay marriage, how he supports, um, how he supports so many liberal causes, how he is in so many ways left wing. We can't just go in and paint the picture that's ugly. We need to listen to what they're actually saying so we don't create straw men arguments because when we do this, it makes it so easy for us. If this is where the ugliness exists, then it's all external. But if it exists in a more subtle fashion, then it exists internal. And this is what I see in the movement. We have to listen to the arguments that these people are making, that a libertarian makes for freedom. Because unless we hear someone in the far right explain the beautiful picture of freedom that they are fighting for, we won't realise that we actually agree with them, that we actually agree with Gavin McInnes' fight for freedom. We need to listen to what people say and then what we need to do is don't listen to what they say. Then when they tell you they are left wing, that means nothing. When they tell you they are a feminist, it means nothing. When Tucker Carlson says that he condemns racism, it means nothing. When people say that they love this message, that they love this movement, it means so little to me now because the amount of times I've heard it where it has and I have known emphatically it was worthless. We need to listen to what people say and then we need to listen to not listen to what they say about themselves. Because how do we vote? How do we vote when it comes to the kingdom of God? Brendan. We vote by taking the position of the kingdom you want to vote for. Tale of two kingdoms. How do you show that you've taken that position? You have the great controversy. You have a 6,000 year political election, how do you vote for the kingdom of heaven? By living, breathing and speaking that that position living breathing back and right embodying and speaking Speaking. I don't agree with the speaking part. If I've learned anything over the last four years, speech doesn't mean a whole lot. What some said so well meaningly for some time was just stay on the boat. Just stay in the movement. If you don't like the leadership, if you don't like what they're saying, if you have to tear up and just keep the bit you like and add your own, just stay in the movement and you'll sail through. Don't agree with that. 
Because how do you vote? How did Adam and Eve vote for equality over freedom? In their case, freedom over equality. How do we, we vote for equality over freedom? Can you vote in God's government, put it on a piece of paper and say, I choose equality over freedom, then turn to your own life and practice freedom over and over and over again, no matter how it harms the salvation of others? People in this movement day after day after day after day are voting for the wrong side while saying that they love this message. You can't stay on the ship by just kind of existing within the movement. That's not what puts someone on this boat. What puts someone, places someone on this ship is adherence to a political creed. You can't vote Republican on a piece of paper and then come and say, where is my universal health care? You have to embody the whole of that political platform and you have to live it. We don't get to write on a ballot paper, paper that we want heaven. We have to live now before we get to heaven what constitutes the kingdom of heaven. And too much of this movement is here. So yes, we're going to study how this impacts our understanding of the Sunday law. But that conclusion, in my mind, is insignificant if we're not able to navigate the nice sounding arguments that are continually made on behalf of men's rights activism today. There was a video on YouTube, a, a short documentary on the split occurring through the evangelical community in America. And they interviewed this far right pastor of this little community, not little community, his, his congregation is absolutely boomed. They interviewed him and he said emphatically, I am not a member of QAnon. I do not believe in QAnon, do not associate me with QAnon. And then he stood up in the pulpit and said, the liberal elite are all pedophiles. Listen to what he says, but don't listen to what he says about himself because when he says he's not a member of QAnon, that's meaningless. When people say I'm not a men's rights activist because I'm not an activist, that's meaningless. It's whether or not you embody their arguments, you think their arguments are reasonable, and then whether you mean to or not, you will live as if their arguments are reasonable. I haven't wanted to teach on the men's rights movement because it's a very dark place to go, especially when you start getting into the use of suicide rates and, and some of those components, some of those arguments that are prolific, but I'm going to have to. So I would like to, I suppose, give a little bit of a warning that we are going to do that. I think we're imminently going to have, hopefully em encompass it in one presentation, um, the arguments about the burdens men carry for providing for family, for we can go back over speech if that's still, I've addressed that before, not understood, going to have to do a presentation that goes into self-harm, depression and suicide. And if you think that's gonna be hard to listen to, it hasn't been hard, hasn't been easy to study. Um, but it's too prolific to leave and it continues to warp people's concepts of, where they stand on this, this line today. Um, we're going to go into the court case of Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. This is Gamergate 2.0. We're living through prophecy. Do we realize that we are living through prophecy? Do we realize what this means to gender equality? That hasn't been pleasant. 
but there is far too much of this and a justification for people's women as well as men their misogyny in what they continue to think is rational reasonable logical and fair and it is not an evolutionary psychologist arguing for biological inherent differences between men and women can make a robust argument that does not mean that they are right a men's rights activist can make a robust argument for how gender stereotypes harm men and they can use the suicide rate to do that. That does not make them right. It does mould whether or not someone in this movement, movement is capable of being a radical feminist. I want to close, but um, I just want to say something after we close. So please don't go immediately. Dear Lord, we see how hard your work is. We see how deep these things lie. We see how hard they are to rid ourselves of them. Lord, I don't think people are seeing the ugliness of what exists in these arguments and in themselves. And I pray that we might, not to crush people, but to save them. I pray, Lord, that the ears who are blocked of hearing might hear and the eyes that are firmly clenched shut might see for their own sake so that people can be on the ship not on an iceberg thinking they're on the ship i pray this in jesus name amen